Hello everyone, Mr. Linder here. Let's talk about the concept of homeostasis. So the idea of homeostasis uh, really started getting traction in the 1800s. Um, and during the 1800s, uh, they were, researchers were really looking at um, the stability of body temperature and heart rate and blood pressure, and they were trying to come up with a concept uh, of constancy within the body. It wasn't though until the 1900s when an American physiologist uh, by the name of Walter Cannon uh, actually coined the term homeostasis. Um, and he used the word homeo uh, because it means like or similar. And so what he was describing was how the body can maintain um, constancy uh, even though there are fluctuations that take place. Um, so the, the idea of homeostasis is really that the body will maintain uh, within typically a range a certain value and there will be fluctuations above and below that value uh, but there's still a certain level of constancy. So for example when you look at uh, these values on this diagram like blood pH and sodium levels and uh, protein levels or lipid levels or sugar levels uh, you'll notice that it's usually presented as a range so blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45 but oftentimes in books um, it will be presented as blood pH is 7.4. 7.4 represents the set point uh, for a particular um, uh, physiological um, uh, concept. So the idea of blood pH, 7.4 is the set point. But homeostasis um, really states that there will be fluctuations above and below that set point number, uh, but it'll still be in the normal homeostatic range. Uh, this idea is known as dynamic constancy. So dynamic constancy is the fluctuations above and below uh, the set point number. And that's why you typically see uh, ranges presented. Um, the, most people know that body temperature uh, is presented as 37 degrees C, uh, but your body temperature will be below or above that set point number uh, because homeostasis again describes that there will be fluctuations above and below that number uh, and it'll still be uh, in a state of normalcy. Now what happens though uh, if you get outside the normal range? If you get outside the normal range, then we start looking at illness or disease. So what are our bodies actually doing? Our bodies are actually monitoring the internal state. Um, and when they monitor the internal state, then they have to take, or our body has to take corrective actions when there is a disruption. If the body fails to maintain homeostasis, then we get into uh, the idea of disease uh, and pathological conditions. Um, and so there's a whole branch of physiology that we call pathophysiology. Uh, pathophysiology is the study of disease, studying the body when it um, doesn't function or doesn't compensate properly. So if we look at this flow chart, organisms that are in homeostasis, there's some sort of change, whether it's an external change or internal change, uh, that causes us to lose homeostasis, and then the organism has to compensate for that. If we compensate properly, we stay well. If we don't compensate properly, uh, then we get illness or disease, which is what we call pathophysiology. So where can pathology come from? Pathology really comes from internal causes or external causes. Um, internal causes of disease uh, would be things like uh, cancer, so tumors, uh, autoimmune disorders, genetic disorders, um, things that uh, would be uh, coming from an internal uh, cause. External causes would be things like pathogens, uh, viruses, bacteria, uh, fungi, uh, so things that you would study in microbiology. Uh, we also know that physical trauma uh, can lead to changes in homeostasis. We know that toxic chemicals can lead to changes in homeostasis, and those two would be external uh, causes of disease. Before we can really, though, get deeper into the understanding of homeostasis, it's important to understand uh, what is the body's internal environment. So in anatomy, you really look at um, what's called the extracellular fluid uh, and the intracellular fluid. Uh, and just looking at this diagram, you can tell that there's actually less extracellular fluid than there is intracellular 
cellular fluid. Um, it's approximately, uh, our bodies are about 66% intracellular fluid and, and you know, another 33 uh, plus percent uh, of extracellular fluid. So we're about two thirds intracellular and one third extracellular. The extracellular fluid uh, is going to be things like the interstitial fluid uh, and your blood plasma. And then of course, intracellular means the fluid that's inside of the cells. So extracellular fluid is outside of the cells. Um, when something changes in the extracellular environment, so when it gets outside of the normal range, that can then trigger compensating mechanisms uh, that need to take place in order to get the fluid back to normal. Uh, for example, uh, if you intake uh, a lot more uh, sodium and your levels of sodium go up in the uh, blood plasma and the interstitial spaces, that can adversely affect uh, your cells. And so there has to be compensating mechanisms for uh, getting sodium levels back to normal. Uh, and we do that through uh, getting rid of sodium. We do that through retaining more water, uh, getting thirsty, drinking more water. Uh, and those are all things that take place physiologically so that we can maintain homeostasis. The intracellular fluid, uh, as I said, is the inside of the cells. Uh, this is where most of your body water uh, is uh, contained. Uh, and really our cells are going to depend on things that are taking place in the extracellular environment because we know that there are there's movement of electrolytes from the intracellular and extracellular environment. And so the homeostasis of cells is gonna depend a lot on what's happening outside uh, of the cell as well. So how do we describe what's taking place? Well, homeostasis depends on what's called mass balance. And simply put, mass balance is really balancing input with output. If you were to look at a basic system, um, if you take in more water, then there's going to be an output of more water in order for you to have a homeostatic balance. Now, of course, we can look at this uh, in more detail. Uh, and so there's this other diagram where you can look at, um, you know, more aspects of what's taking place in mass balance. But from a simplified um, diagram, it's really just input balancing with output. Um, so if you take in more sugar and your blood sugar goes up, there needs to be compensating mechanisms to bring your blood sugar back down. Um, and so this is this idea of mass balance. So the law of mass balance, if we look at it from um, an equational standpoint, you'll notice that there are positive portions to the law of mass balance and then there are negative portions uh, to the law of mass balance. So we have terms like existing body load, intake, metabolic production, and then minus excretion and metabolic removal. And this collectively is what we call mass balance. So what is the law of mass balance? It's basically the amount of substance in the body has to remain constant and any gains have to be offset by losses, right? So inputs and outputs need to be balanced. Uh, a really good example is uh, water loss from the body. Uh, if you were to lose uh, water by sweating, urinating, breathing, fecal matter, um, you would then have to take in more water to counterbalance that loss of water. Uh, and so you get thirstier uh, and you take that water in uh, and that uh, will help us to balance things out. In this uh, equation, when they use a term like load, uh, the load really represents how much of the substance is in the body. Uh, so for example, uh, we can talk about sodium load in the body or calcium load in the body or iron load in the body. It really just represents how much uh, exists within the body. Intake is a very uh, easy term uh, to uh, explain. Intake really just means to be brought into the body. So bringing in water, bringing in nutrients um, through the digestive system, being absorbed into the circulatory system, uh, taking things in through our lungs, uh, absorbing through our skin. Uh, these are all intake mechanisms. Uh, metabolic production. There's more discussion to be had about that because uh, metabolism uh, is, is broad. There, there's a lot of chemical reactions that take place within the body, but we have the ability to uh, produce 
uh, certain uh, molecules within the body. And so we have carbon dioxide production that takes place in the body. We have lactic acid production uh, that takes place in the body. And so those would be metabolic production uh, types of things. And, and those are going to affect your overall mass balance. Those things can increase uh, how much of a substance exists in the body. Uh, if you're exercising and you produce lactic acid, then your lactic la acid levels are going to go up. And so you're going to get out of homeostatic balance. Think of it like a teeter-totter. And so if you're out of balance, then you have to have a mechanism to get rid of a particular substance. So excretion is the elimination of a particular substance. So getting rid of it from the body through our urine, through our feces, from our lungs, from our skin. Um, the term xenobiotic uh, comes up a lot when you talk about excretion because we excrete foreign substances from the body xenobiotics or anything that's foreign to the body. So artificial uh, sweeteners, preservatives in our food, things that are uh, things that shouldn't be in the body. We need to excrete them uh, and eliminate them. And then of course, metabolic removal, uh, converting some molecule to something else, uh, taking alcohol and converting it into another form so that it can be cleared, so that it can be excreted uh, from the body. So metabolic removal uh, is important important in physiology because, again, it keeps us in mass balance. When we talk about mass balance, uh, we also describe something called mass flow. Uh, mass flow is really a way to follow a substance through the body. And, and really what we do is when we follow a substance through the body, we can look at the rate of intake, we can look at rates of output, we can look at rates of production. Uh, and so mass flow gives us an opportunity uh, to describe uh, what a substance is actually doing uh, within the body. Uh, for example, we could look at the mass flow of, say, glucose through the body. Um, in order to do that, we need to know the concentration of glucose. We also need to know uh, the volume flow of glucose through the body. <clears throat> and so, for example, we could take something like if we had a concentration of 50, uh, let's say 50 grams uh, per uh, liter. Uh, a liter is 1,000 milliliters. That's the concentration of glucose. And we knew that its volume flow uh, was two milliliters uh, per minute. We could come up with the mass flow for glucose. Okay, So if we were studying glucose here, we could actually look at its mass flow. So milliliters would cancel. You'd get 50 times two, which is 100. 100 divided by 1,000. And so we would have the mass flow in grams per minute, okay, so grams per minute, and that would be 100 divided by 1,000, which would be 0 0.1, okay? And so that gives us a numerical value, a quantitative uh, number that we could look at how glucose is actually moving uh, through the body, and therefore we can look at its homeostasis. Uh, we also use calculations uh, to look at what's called clearance of substances from the body. Uh, so clearance represents the rate uh, in which a substance disappears from the blood. Uh, the volume of blood cleared of a particular substance uh, per unit time. The kidneys, uh, the liver, these are primary clearance organs in the body. Uh, we can look at how hepatocytes in the liver handle foreign substances, how they handle xenobiotics, and they create metabolites that can end up in your urine or they can end up in your feces. Uh, and so we're clearing them from the body. Uh, this brings up something called pharmacokinetics. We look a lot at, at, at how drugs are cleared uh, from the body because, again, we have to maintain homeostasis. So if you're putting a chemical, you're putting a drug in the body, you've got to be able to clear it, and the rate at which you clear it will determine uh, when you can take your next dosage of something. So if you've had uh, 500 milligrams of acetaminophen uh, in the morning at 8 a.m., when's the next time you could take another 500 milligrams of acetaminophen? Well, that de depends on its pharmacokinetics. It depends on its clearance rate uh, from the body. And it's not just the kidneys and the liver that can clear things. We also have clearance in saliva, in sweat, in breast milk, in hair. Uh, you'll notice ethanol from somebody's breath or garlic breath. So we do know that things are being cleared uh, from the body. 
in other ways. Um, a, a really important concept that we'll pick up with next time is homeostasis does not mean equilibrium. And so we'll focus on that next time. Take care. Bye.